We will start uh, today to discuss um, the research that Joe Karaganis has done. He is with the Social Science Research Council. He directs projects on media, technology and culture, including uh, a program on necessary knowledge for a democratic public sphere, as well as on culture, creativity and information technology. His research focuses on the relationship between digital convergence and cultural production, and he has recently included works on the politics of open source adoption, the cultural industries, and the impact of intellectual property expansion on the philanthropic field. He's an associate editor of the Oxford Dictionary of the Social Sciences and an editor of the Structures of Participation in Digital Culture program. And he's worked as a consultant, but he's here now to talk on his uh, recent uh, research that focuses on media piracy in developing countries. Joe, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Let's see if this is on the microphone. Oh, even better. <laughs> oh, hold on. One more comment. We're live streaming uh, this session as well, so also welcome to those people who are watching us via the live stream. That's why it's important to use your microphone, because Excellent. otherwise okay. they can't hear you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Marieke, for the opportunity to, to address the Parliament. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I, I'm really going to rush through a set of findings uh, from our reports. The, the, the URL you see on the screen is really where you can find out much more about the work. Uh, there is a public policy license. If you read through the, li the license uh, for downloading the report, it takes you to a free copy. Please help yourselves to a free copy. Um, it's a very long study that's taken us about four years to complete. Uh, I'll give a very brief overview and try and localize some of the issues to, to Europe. Very little of the work is actually about Europe, so they're, they're, you know, most of what we're talking about is uh, the developing world and in particular middle-income countries uh, on, and on sort of fast paths to development. Uh, this is the study. I, I wanted to say a, a couple words about why we did it. Uh, what the, the, the broader context uh, is in which we wrote the report. Uh, we began this work really in 2006 uh, in the context of a conversation between some of the researchers who had been involved in some other SSRC work, uh, notably uh, the Brazil, the, the, a group in Brazil associated with the Catulia Vargas Foundation, uh, of which Pedro is a part, uh, some Indian researchers working out of uh, Delhi and Bangalore. And we were looking at a, at, a, at a discourse about piracy constructed primarily on the basis of industry literature that was coming up with numbers like 80% uh, of the DVD market in India is pirated or 90% of the software market in China is pirated. Huge numbers, numbers often in approaching 100% of the market characterized as, as pirated. And you know, we, the, you know, the, the intellectual property debate was increasingly shaped by these kinds of claims. And the enforcement debate was increasingly being directed against the countries who were, uh, you know, uh, whose, whose, whose economies were characterized in these terms. Well, when we looked at these numbers, we, we saw an opportunity to bring a very different kind of perspective to the table that really wasn't so much a question of uh, what are the losses to, stake, to, to copyright stakeholders in these contexts, but what does media access look like from a consumer perspective primarily? And how does the consumer perspective weigh against the, the rights holder perspective? And when we looked at numbers like 80% of the economy of, uh, of, of the so of, uh, 80 of the software market in India or China is pirated, I mean, another, we, we sort of began by turning that question around and asked, well, you know, that's not a drain on the, on the media economy, strictly speaking. That is the economy. For most people, mo in most of the time, that is the media economy. Their primary form of access to media goods, to software, is the illicit. Uh, uh, the, the primary forms of access are illicit. And we saw virtually no discussion of that. that you know, to, ask, to ask the problem that way is to characterize it as a media access problem and to look at the boundaries between the licit and the illicit economies. Uh, the debate as we saw it at the time and as it still, uh, still is presented was overwhelmingly in terms of criminality, criminal activity, and the, and, and the push to, to further criminalize uh, sort of basic forms of media access and often access to critical media goods. So while DVDs arguably are not an essential good, uh, it's very hard to run a modern economy if you don't have a software infrastructure. And these were the kinds of, of trade-offs that, we, we, that were quite obvious if you, if you spend any time in these countries. But that was, but that was completely, op completely absent from the policy debate. And at the same time, we were, we were witnessing this massive ramp-up of enforcement. 
All right, so the last decade is, is, is really a story not only about the rise of digital piracy, but uh, the story of the, uh, the rise of an, uh, of an enforcement industry <coughs> that has included a, a, a just massive reorganization of administrative capacities, policing capacities, uh, changes in law, uh, generally at quite some distance from the actual cultural practices. So one of the things we've documented in this, this report is the, the rise of enforcement. Now the pirate, you know, the, the pirate decade, which argu arguably you could call the last, the last 10 years, is also the enforcement decade in which what matters in, in, in intellectual property is not the growth in uh, sort of formal norms of protection. So the, the extension of, of the copyright term from the life of the author plus 50 years to the life of the author plus, seven, to plus 70 to now life of the author plus 90, which is being discussed in some contexts, is really not the main story. The marginal returns on those kinds of increased protections is quite low. The marginal, the marginal returns on enforcement, at least as the industry argued it when they were saying that if a 90% market, a 90% parted market um, could be brought to lower levels and, and, and uh, realize much, much larger revenue gains if, if you could reduce the, the piracy rate in China from 90% to 70%, you'd have achieved something. Well, that's the story we were uh, interested in, in unpacking from, a, again, a perspective that was informed by questions of media access, <coughs> questions of the boundary between legal and il illegal markets, questions of competition within those markets. And so we put, we put together a project that uh, comprised four major country studies, India, Brazil, South Africa, and Russia, primarily. Uh, we uh, integrated the work of some other scholars who were working in Mexico and Bolivia and Hungary, and, uh, and other work as sort of opportunities presented themselves. And we uh, really organized the work around sort of four major sets of questions. One was, a, one was uh, an inquiry into the organization of piracy. How is piracy organized? And here the, the story is really about the transition from uh, primarily optical disc-based piracy, CDs and DVDs, to pure digital. Uh, downloaded, but even more than downloaded, just uh, uh, digital piracy as part of the massive flows of digital files that are now part of everybody's life. Uh, whether it's hand-to-hand -hand in the form of, of portable hard drives or, or downloaded through peer-to-peer -peer tools or online cloud-based cloud storage. Uh, the range of, 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 of technologies through which people can share large files and consequently share media files has just exploded in the last 10 years. And the enforcement conversation really has to begin with some account of why that, would ever, why that will change. <laughs> and our conclusion was that it's not going to change. It's only going to get easier and easier to share large files. Uh, so, you know, in, in the enforcement context, we, were, we, were always, we, we, we also noted the lack of, a, of an end game. You know, what is the digital economy that uh, the, the copyright stakeholders, particularly in industry, wanted to see emerge out of these different enforcement efforts? And the debate was striking for its lack of any sort of art, articulated end game. So, you know, our conclusions were quite basic in a way. Uh, they have been called obvious in some contexts. <laughs> Uh, and we're happy, to, happy for that because, uh, in some respects, we are introducing a very obvious perspective into a debate that has rigorously ignored the obvious, uh, which is that you know, the piracy problem is primarily a question of high prices, low incomes, and ever cheaper digital technologies. And th you know, those three things are really most of the most of the debate. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what's going to change? Enforcement is enforcement barely counts in this in this story. Right, enforcement is the thing that happens just around the edges of that relationship. So we haven't seen any evidence in, ten years of, uh, in, in the tenure arc that we pr deal with primarily that any of these enforcement efforts have had an impact on the overall availability of pirated goods. And we track contexts in which uh, enforcement play is, is part of the game of whack-a-mole. Does, does whack-a-mole translate into a European context? You know, this is a child's game where you're sort of whacking at this mole that pops up out of a hole and then another one pops up. And these are, this is the, the nature of the, uh, the nature of the enforcement effort is a game of sort of ongoing uh, whack-a-mole, you know, f fighting the latest version of the problem. But the, just the, r the range of channels through which piracy can happen is just, it's just as broad as the digital economy at this point. And the, and the core functionalities overlap in, a fun in fundamental ways. So the, the work ultimately involved about 35 researchers over three years. Uh, again, it, because of the countries we were primarily interested in, it focused heavily on this question of the, the optical disk economy and the, really the nascent transition to a pure digital, uh, you know, digital form of file sharing. So the question of broadband is, is 
uh, I mean, it's a new question everywhere, but it's a very new question if you're looking at Brazil or India, where significant rates of broadband adoption are really only, are really, really only in the last couple of years. But the, these countries are going to be on a very fast arc toward the kinds of pure digital file sharing that, that are characteristic of Europe and the U.S. now, where there's very little optical disk piracy to speak of anymore. It's just not relevant to the, to the larger picture. So, uh, this is the study, how it, uh, this is how it breaks down. Again, if you want to look at it in more detail, please do so online. I want to very, just very briefly uh, sketch three arguments for you and, and break them up into segments in case people want to intervene. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the economics of piracy. I mean, the, the, the economics in developing countries are pretty much as I've described. You've had, you have media goods that are priced generally at U.S. or European levels, uh, confronting uh, populations who have incomes a fraction of those of the U.S. or Europe. And that disconnect is really what creates the uh, a context of very high-priced legal markets and massive low-priced or zero-priced pirate markets. That's the, that's the dynamic that we, that we describe in India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, et cetera. But the same factors are at work when you look at the U.S. or Europe. And I want to I spend a couple minutes trying to translate some of that economic argument into the European context or the, uh, or the, the high income country context more generally. Second, I want to talk a little bit about research. Uh, much of the first section of our report is a, you know, an elaborate uh, documentation slash dissection of the existing discourse largely produced through industry sponsored research. Uh, the big problem here is that there's no transparency to it. You can't dig very far underneath the industry numbers because they don't show you how they got them, um, almost without exception. And there are a couple exceptions that we can get into if you're interested, but uh, it's a debate constructed on the basis of completely opaque research. And you know, despite what is now a decade of, of really mounting criticism of these research practices, there's been very little indication that that's going to change. And from our perspective, that's illegitimate. You can't conduct a serious policy conversation on the basis of research that's basically just asking, asking people to take your word for it. Uh, there are enough problems on the surface of the research models, just what, in terms of what you can tell about them, to really call that kind of, uh, uh, to, to really you know, make that, uh, that faith unwarranted. So a lot of what we're doing at the outset of the work is just a plea for more transparency. If you're going to have a policy debate, make sure that you know how the, uh, the numbers are that, are, that inform that debate are, 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 uh, are developed. And then finally, uh, if, if we have time, and it's beginning to look like we won't. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, governance and the last 15 years or so and in, in, in the evolution of governance. And, and here in the report, that's mostly a story about uh, the role of the USTR, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office in the U.S., which is really the engine of the enforcement debate. Uh, the EC just la lags way behind the USTR and its aggressive assertion of U.S. multimedia company interests. Uh, and, uh, and in the translation of those interests into policy positions. And it's, again, a, you know, it's been a kind of black box. It's been an industry-owned and operated dialogue that's beginning to open up slightly in the context of uh, public interest and especially uh, consumer group interest uh, in participation in this process. So there's a, a transitional moment in which there's some pressure on a traditionally very closed policymaking process in the U.S. Uh, that I'll, I'll, I can get into in a bit more detail if there's time, but I, I'm doubtful at this point. So just to, to give you a, an indication of, of uh, you know, some, some of the reference points in this debate, this is uh, a chart submitted by the RIAA in the context of the, of the suit against LimeWire, which is currently underway. And it pretty much presents what the industry thinks should be going on in these markets, you know, ever-rising ever levels of album sales. Uh, you know, essentially, and, and, and this is a chronic problem. And most most of the industries we're, we're, most most of the industries we're looking at have become very, very. Uh, you know, they've grown enormously in the last ten or fifteen years, primarily off the transition to optical discs. So, in the music business, this is the CD, and the in the in the movie business, it's the DVD. Uh, you know, our, our perspective, generally speaking, is that these are these are transitory technologies, right? These are not the, the, there was there, there's an arc to these. Uh, the CD is already an obsolete object. The DVD will shortly be an obsolete object, and the, but the structures of, of the, the cost structures and the, uh, the, the institutional structures that have accompanied the rise of those objects are really, uh, you know, the, 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 the crisis of piracy is really a crisis of 
the cost structures around those two objects. So there are plenty of there are plenty of um, uh, there are plenty of models in the music business and in the film business that are that are reconceptualizing themselves around different kinds of cost structures, but the the big incumbents haven't done that, and that's because the the big four record labels are still 70 percent dependent on CD sales, and I'll show you in a second why that's a problem. Uh, the big Hollywood studios 50 percent on DVD sales. I mean these are markets that are that are you know l legacy in the worst sense of the word. They are they are they are not positioned to make an easy transition to other modes of delivery. And as the digital revolution continues, the costs of delivery fall to, to near zero. And the costs of the goods, consequently, are falling. And in a competitive market, that's what happens to the costs. They fall. So when you don't have falling costs in these markets, you really have to start looking to issues of competition. What's the market structure? You know, how big are the incumbents? And what are the incumbents doing to protect their existing market model? So if you look globally, actually, Overall, entertainment and media expenditures are rising fast. Right? There's, a, and there's a, just a plethora of new ways to consume media. There's lots of competition in the media space in terms of what, what competes for your time and money that simply didn't exist 15 years ago. And the, the story of the fall of the CD and of the revenues associated with the CD is also that story, where 15 years ago, if you had some discretionary income, uh, you, you know, very likely you're going to spend it on music and, and in particular on the CD. Now it's, you know, there's so many different, so many different things competing for that, do that dollar or euro, right? Uh, from, so from software to cell phone services to DVDs to uh, any number of other activities. So there's, there's been an overall uh, increase and in, in fact quite a rapid increase in the, over, in, in the expenditures on these goods, but the distribution of what those, the distribution of those expenditures has changed dramatically. So this, these sources are coming. These charts are coming out of the World Association of Newspapers. So they're mostly interested in the way these issues impact uh, newspaper markets. So, in a context of overall increase in expenditures, but changing mixes of of of, of what's, what that money is spent on, there are going to be winners and losers. The losers, although it's not signaled in this chart, the losers are going to be the companies that are invested primarily in recorded media because increasingly there's just no way to control the distribution chain for recorded media. Right? Uh, there's no way to get a handle on CD or DVD, DVD dis distribution anymore. Uh, Blu-ray is going to go the same way. So to give you the record, comp the, uh, the, the music business example of this, that earlier chart which kind of envisioned a sort of ever increasing line of album sales was really describing a bubble. It was describing the CD bubble, right? So the transition to digital has crushed the CD as an object. I don't know how many of you have bought a CD in the last year, five years even. Uh, when I present to college students, the answer is nobody. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's gone. It's gone as an object, except, as a, except in certain kinds of, of age brackets and, and, uh, and income brackets, where there's still a premium placed on the CD as a collector's good, uh, where other kinds of, of, of valuation come into play, legacy, stereo systems, these sorts of things. Uh, the, you know, some of this is clearly attributable, attributable to piracy, but it's very difficult to isolate how much of it is attributable to piracy because there are so many other factors shaping the transformation of this market. So the big one, which rarely gets discussed, is just the, the shift from the CD to the single as a unit of sale. So 10 or 15 years ago, you know, the unit of sale was a you know, $15 or 15 euro disc that had 12 songs on it. Now the, now the unit of sale is a $1 or 1 euro song. And it turns out that when people can cherry pick the best songs off an album, they don't want the eight that are just filler. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's, that's a market transition that has nothing to do with piracy, but it's profound. It completely transforms the economics of, 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 of music sales. Uh, to give you an example of a, of a growing market, so what are people spending their money on? Games. Games is an exploding market, right? So, uh, in, in all these, in, in, in the growing markets and in the in the overall expenditures, you're talking about rising levels of, of media and, and entertainment expenditure uh, at r rising, at, or growing at faster rates than income growth. Right? So you're having a much larger portion of of income spent on media and entertainment. Uh, but uh, like I said, it's being distributed differently. Here's, you know, here's the global game market. 
uh, Angry Birds, which is a huge success story, bizarrely, right? Uh, what are people, what are, what's competing with the music and the, and, and the music CD and the DVD? I mean, it's things like Angry Birds, All right? This is a Finnish company, by the way, that's made a fortune on a, on a tiny investment in Angry Birds because the game's ridiculously simplistic, but it's, uh, you know, an example of this increasingly competitive space. So, you know, we're generally less interested in the question of how much revenue is, floating to the, uh, is flowing to the incumbent companies in this space than the question of how much culture is being produced overall and whether, you know, and whether you can develop some metrics for understanding whether you're living in a rich culture or a poor culture in terms of how much stuff is available, available to you. And here, there's really very little solid research and, and you know, as this debate moves forward in Europe, it'd be very interesting to, to develop some more robust accounts of of, of the state of health of the European, well, not, not culture industries, because that's the wrong emphasis to put on it, but culture, in term, and, and the simplest metric for the health of, a, of culture is to simply count up how much is being produced. In music, this is, a, this is an emerging field. There's been some interesting work recently by Joel Waldfogel, uh, Felix oberholzer gee and Coleman Strumpf looking at just the number of albums produced in the last 10 years as the digital transition has just you know, crushed the costs of production and distribution. And it turns out that the number of albums is rising. Well, if the, you know, where, the incentives problem is really an incentive to create. And if, you're, if, if creation is grow, if the number of things that are being created is growing, then maybe, this, maybe the incentives are sufficient. Um, in, the, in the audiovisual market, I mean, here's just a chart from, uh, from the European Audiovisual Laboratory. You know, where, is, this the, is this a picture of a European film industry in crisis? You know, you, I, I don't see it. <laughs> now, the European film industry is, 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 is not a, an, a, you know, a, a strictly market-based enterprise. I mean, there are a lot of ways in which film is subsidized in Europe that isn't true of the U.S. But if the question is what, you know, are, are the different communities in Europe uh, succeeding in finding ways to express, them express themselves audiovisually, Surely the number of films produced, you know, it has some bearing on that. It's, 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 it's a useful metric to, to begin with. Now, it really should just be the beginning of a conversation about what that looks like. Is that one minute? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I should. Okay, <laughs> one minute. All right, well, moving you'll, along. You'll come back later. <laughs> okay, well, just uh, the incomes question again. So incomes have, have flattened out in the U.S. and Europe over the last decade or so. That, should, that shouldn't be a surprise. The percentage spent on... Uh, Leisure goods, this is from uh, a recently released study by, uh, by, uh, by a couple of researchers at the LSE. The percent, the, that pink line in the middle is the percent spent on leisure goods. So what you see here is, a, is, is, is you know, essentially flat expenditures on everything but leisure and housing. So you begin to think of media, media markets and housing markets in a sense as competing for the same dollars, right? So the problem of the media market is not the pirate markets per se, but rather uh, the other areas that are, that are where, where consumers are facing growing costs. This is the Hadopi, uh, a study rele released by H the Hadopi organization in France. It was an attempt to characterize how much downloading is being done in France uh, post Hadopi. This was just last last month, released in March, and they broke it down. Into, they broke their categories of consumers into uh, consumers who only buy licitly and consumers who acknowledge uh, buying, buying pirated goods. And they've presented this in the most confusing way they could find to do so. But you know, the the, the important part of the story is really he here. So what, what, who are the consumers who are spending a lot of money per month on media? You know, above 31 euros a month and above 100 euros a month. That red column is the column that acknowledges having pirated goods. Right? The blue column is the column of people who say that, no, they only buy legal goods. So what, what you're seeing here is really uh, a demonstration of that piracy is complementary to high levels of media consumption. And it really shouldn't come as a surprise that the people who are Complete fanatics for film or music uh, are, you know, both the the largest consumers in the, the legal market and also the largest consumers in, in the pirate market, because the the the, the range of, ac of the, the the nature of access has changed so fundamentally that people can scoop in much more media consumption into their daily lives than than they could before. Uh, you know, I'll I'll stop there and and take questions. There's certainly more if uh, people want to see me expand on any of this. Thank you so much, Joe, and I'm sorry I have to cut you off, but this is a debate that can last for a long time, and we are going to get back to you and to the questions you have. 
But first, um, we're going to hear from Lea Postma, who is with the Dutch Consumer Rights Organization. Uh, the position of consumers came back in your uh, presentation a few times. And of course, uh, it's something that we deal with every day. So we look forward to your presentation, um, short introduction as well. And then uh, we will go on to the next speaker and open up the discussion. You need some time for technology. Okay, so then I'm going to share a little bit more about what the consumer union in the Netherlands does. Um, it serves about a half a million members. And all its activities are aimed at strengthening the position of consumers and empowering them to make informed choices. They publish a wide range of magazines, books, but also have a lot of subscribers via the web in the Netherlands. Social media are increasingly important uh, for a dialogue with consumers as well. Besides comparative tests of products, services, there is also uh, switchover services, financial advantages and personal services for members. And uh, a lot of efforts are uh, put into campaigning both in the Netherlands and internationally. And currently the main campaigns are on financial services, healthcare, food and the internet and digital safety. Excuse me, we're still uh, working on the technique, so I'll do that in one minute. Yeah, there you okay. go. If it's working, yes. Yeah. So I've already been properly introduced. Thank you for that. Um, it's an honor to be here. And um, let me see in short, I'll, be, uh, I'll try to do it as quick as possible because we're running late in time. So um, I'll skip the introduction. I'll, I'll keep it brief to say that I'm a campaign leader at the Consumers Association. And... Um, as our previous speaker already stressed out, um, enforcement measures are not working and um, we like to present you a bit a different proposal that aims at helping consumers and uh, copyright in future. And we're doing that together with representatives of artists, so both on the demand and supply side of this market. Okay, our points of departure. Um, well, the Dutch situation is a bit... Um, a bit special in the way that uh, downloading for private use is allowed. So in Holland we have a home copying exception. This is important to memorize when I'm presenting this proposal to you. And uh, performers at this moment get paid through, a, uh, it's regulated by private copying system. And uh, it's a, a levy on blank CDs and DVDs at the moment. And um, in politics right now there's a big discussion going, as well as in Europe, um, on what the future of copyright will be. So the aim at the moment, they are thinking about putting a total ban on home copying. That means offline and online, so as well a, a ban on downloading. Well, uh, of course, uh, if you look at the European Directive, you have a choice. So you can either put a ban on the home copying or you can uh, leave a home copying exception. That's in short the choice you have. So it's important to memorize that you cannot think about just any solution, uh, not any solution is just possible, so you have to um, take care of the European Directive uh, if you make a solution for future of copyright. Well, we think that um, consumers, of course, want to enjoy mu music and film, so they want to have in the digital environment access without restrictions. Um, and performers, uh, at first, they want to be heard and seen. So uh, we're thinking more about trying to find a solution in enabling use instead of punishing for it. And as we have just seen, enforcing man measures are not having the right effect. So I think that's a good way to go. And uh, first of all, so privacy of internet use is key. So we try to uh, take that into account as well. And um, any kind of system you put in place, it should be transparent because you want to be accountable for everything you do. So what we worked out is a proposal that works in two steps. First of all, we want to change the current copying system in Holland. Uh, at the Holland, in, at the moment, you pay uh, a remuneration to artists with every copy you make on a blank DVD and CD. And we think this is a wrong thinking. We think you want to uh, buy a right to be able to copy for your own use, music and film. So um, instead of... Uh, paying for every copy, we want a remuneration on recording and playback devices. So you buy this device and you can copy whatever you want for your own use. We think that's a better uh, starting point. And at that same time, you don't need to ban on, on uh, 
home copying and on downloading. But later on, of course, 70 uh, uh, at this moment, it's important to notice that if you look at uh, how me people make copies at home, only 30% of copies are made online. So, as we all know, internet use is rising and rising, and of course, in the future, at one point, the majority of people will make copies from the internet. We think uh, that will be the same uh, in the future. So we uh, propose the second step in this proposal. If 70% of people are making copies on the internet, and that means that the vast majority is using the internet to uh, copy few, uh, music and film, we would like to introduce an internet payment system. And it means that um, artists are going to be remunerated through an internet payment and all other levies will be abolished. Um, and that can be a voluntary payment, for instance, to write to non-commercial downloading and we believe as well non-commercial uploading should be possible because I don't think consumers should be punished for uploading. It's, it's strange that you're going to enforce on, the on uploading and not on downloading. That's the system we have now in Holland and it's a bit strange. It's not an, an ecosystem in that way. And of course the remuneration can be in monthly or yearly. We didn't uh, put all the details already in place because it's, it's, a very, it's a thing for the future. So we only think about the principle. And, and, um, first, and what is important as well is that uploading is always illegal and there's no exception uh, possible within European legislation. So that's why you can um, realize this system, but you have to do it on voluntary collective rights management. That's why I put also coll voluntary collective rights management in it. Well, what are the advantages of such a proposal? Of course, you don't need to prosecute internet users. As we have seen, enforcement is not working. And uh, well, like uh, in France, we have the three strikes out, the graduated response. I don't think that's a good way of punishing people for wanting to use uh, music and film. So uh, it means also that you have a free flow of information and you don't need to infringe on the privacy of internet users. Uh, for instance, if you want to monitor uh, if people are following the rules, people have often mentioned like deep package inspection use, uh, deep package inspection uh, as a way to uh, monitor internet packages which is uh, which means that all the packages go through internet, you open them to see if someone is uh, following the law or not. And that's a huge privacy infringement, which we don't want uh, to have. And with this system, you don't need to infringe on the privacy. That's why we are very uh, in favor of this system. At the same time, uh, if you keep all the options open, of course, more innovation is possible. I think that the entertainment industry needs to innovate because there's not enough supply on the internet. I think they need to catch up with the digital uh, revolution. They didn't yet. And I think that with this system, to keep it more open, will be giving more of a level playing field. And of course, last but not least, with this system in Holland, already we have a collective rights management. And with this system, it means that one third of the remuneration goes to producers, one third to performing artists, and one third to authors. So in short, it's a very fair remuneration. And this is also the div division, the same division we are proposing in our proposal in the Netherlands. So in short, we believe in enabling use instead of disabling, not to punish people for wanting to use music and film in the digital environment, and um, of course, there are a lot of changes that can be made also in European Union legislation. For instance, um, at this moment, the Copyright Act is limited because you have limited exceptions to this exclusivity. So you only have a home copying exception, but that's not enough. Um, the same thing is the digital on demand is set to individual exploitation. That's also a problem because if you want to distribute, you have to have an agreement with all individual producers. Of course, this is also stopping the market. And uh, we would be very pleased if, uh, if you would look at this as well. Um, ISPs are exempt from liability. Maybe we could rebalance this a bit more because we don't want to have a focus on enforcement on consumers. But I think that where 
uh, people are commercially exploiting uh, um, authors' rights, for instance, of course, um, with, um, um, if, if the authors accept and, and they, ha they consent in this, it's no problem because we like to uh, have more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, as a system, but with the consent of right holders. And if there is no consent, well, we should look at to put a f uh, focus on enforcement on these parties instead of consumers. Uh, well, more in general, uh, last, what I think is very important is rights are being executed individually. That means, um, actually, that's contradictory how the Internet works because the Internet is all about sharing and using. So that should be rebalanced as well. Actually, the legislation in general is very based on the old idea of uh, author's rights. And if we want to have a stable future in copyright, we need to rebalance this. Well, our proposal is, of course, about enabling use instead of disabling. And in short, what we really wish for is that the consumer can enjoy this music and film without restriction. The performer can create with a getting a, 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 without being inhibited and getting a fair remuneration because we think they deserve a fair remuneration. And the industry should facilitate the distribution in an innovative way because at, at the moment, the industry has not been catching up with the digital revolution. If you have any questions. Yes. Thank you, Leah, for this very um, clear presentation and compact presentation. Yeah, try to do it as, as fast as possible. You did a very possible. good job. <laughs> and um, we will have one more presenter and then there will be okay. a debate. Uh, the no next problem. speaker will be Pedro Mizukami, who is with the Center for Technology and Society in uh, Brazil. He's a researcher for this center, and uh, it's in Rio de Janeiro, and he has done work related to copyright law and licensing, internet regulation, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, and open access publishing. He has a master's degree in constitutional law from the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. Please go ahead, Pedro. Thank you, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I'll try to make this uh, as short as I can. Uh, this uh, presentation has two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll actually give a brief overview of the current state of play, uh, the current scenario of enforcement policy in Brazil. And in the second part, I'd like to go over the legislative landscape for the digital agenda in Brazil. So as Joe was speaking, <clears throat> uh, the past decade, decade can be seen as the enforcement decade. And Brazil uh, is one of the best examples of how uh, external policy, basically EU-wise external policy, uh, through the special 3-1 process, resulted in actual institutional mutations in several countries. Uh, actually, Brazilian law, despite our reputation, is quite strong, and enforcement policy in general is extremely strong. Uh, criminal copyright infringement of a commercial nature, as of 2003, must be prosecuted ex officio, which means that Police have the duty to investigate, uh, prosecutors have the duty to prosecute, and judges have the, judge, uh, the uh, duty to trial uh, any act of copyright infringement done in a commercial context as soon as they uh, get to know that the act has occurred. So this shifts the burden of actually going after infringers from the private sector to the public sector. So uh, the industry still provokes the, the, uh, the, the public sector into action. But uh, as default, uh, as the standard in legislation, Brazilian legislation, uh, they have the duty to act as soon as they know that copyright infringement is going on. Uh, as of 2004, we have a specialized uh, intellectual property uh, enforcement forum, the CNCP, which stands for the National Council on Combating Piracy and you know, Intellectual Property Crimes. Uh, this has done great uh, uh, work for, for coordination between federal law enforcement agents and this council which is public and private uh, has all of the federal law enforcement agencies uh, sitting alongside industry representatives and representatives from several ministries in Brazil. Uh, so during the years, the first years of the national council, there was great advance in uh, coordination between these authorities. Uh, 
most copyright infringement in Brazil is actually prosecuted at the state level, not the federal level. Uh, so this is, uh, has, done, uh, has uh, affected counterfeiting and hard goods piracy much more than any other type of piracy. Uh, and the number of raids, arrests, and seizures and sentences has definitely increased the, the past 10 years. Uh, it's undeniable that compared to 2001, Brazil has actually a very, very strong enforcement policy. Uh, so the question that we are left with, uh, with is how good is that? Uh, what, uh, is, has that? Has that done any, uh, has solved Brazilian problems? Uh, when it comes to external pressure, not at all. This is from the recent uh, USTR Special 301 report. Uh, it starts with, with a compliment. Enforcement actions have increased under the coordination of the National Council to Combat Piracy, and these increased actions included several major operations in the beginning of 2011. The United States encourages Brazil to continue this work in 2011. However, piracy and counterfeiting persist at significant levels in Brazil, including book piracy and a reported growth in piracy over the internet. So uh, basically, Brazil has done uh, almost everything that was asked by the USTR, USTR in this special 301 reports. And this is actually uh, direct, uh, a direct channel for industry demands. But uh, it is still on the watch list. And pressure is, is, is still, it's not uh, as strong as it was in the beginning of the decade, but it's still there. And, it left Brazil with an institutional framework that is uh, unable to deal with the problem of piracy uh, by, uh, by looking at its sources and its roots. So we have a series of issues. Uh, there are limits to ex official enforcement. And there's a lack of government resources. So between uh, murder and actual robbery and intellectual property crimes, there's a clear uh, priority between these uh, types of offenses. And since there are limited government resources, it doesn't matter that the police have ex officio duty to investigate and judges have to try and prosecutors have to prosecute because uh, there are priorities in law enforcement. And since criminal, uh, so violent crimes are, are, are much more dangerous than intellectual property crimes, there's a, a clear order of preference. Uh, access barriers continue to drive demand for piracy. And this was, was what was Joe, Joe was talking about. Uh, in terms of pricing see, and licensing and distribution, the, there are states in Brazil which do not have, uh, most cities do not have a, a film theater. Uh, all of the film theaters are con uh, concentrated in the capital cities. So there are distribution issues, there are access issues that drive demand, uh, push demand forward. And these are not solved through enforcement measures. Uh, there's absolutely no dialogue on business models. Uh, enforcement and ed education dominate policy debates. Uh, the National Council on Combating Piracy uh, has developed a discourse during, during the years. It has been active, uh, claiming that the problem of piracy can only be solved through uh, enforcement measures, educational measures, and uh, economic measures. And these would, would be actual discussions on business models. But the composition of the council, the industry representatives at, at the council, have, do not have the authority, authority to discuss business models. Uh, all they can ask, all they can do is ask for tax cuts, which the government is, of course, not a, uh, uh, very happy to concede. And enforcement measures have been pushed to, to their limits. Uh, these uh, actions in 2011 in Brazil are probably the most extreme uh, actions we are ever going to see the Brazilian government taking. Uh, this uh, uh, implies the occupation of pirate markets through several days, as happened in Rio de Janeiro. And what we are left with is uh, a rough consensus on education. And uh, we tackle the issue of education in the report. The first chapter has a, an entire section uh, dedicated to education and awareness campaigns. Uh, and the conclusion is that they are as ineffective as uh, enforcement measures, and they also have uh, severe collateral, uh, the potential to cause severe collateral damage. Uh, in Brazil, we, we actually have a few uh, educational campaigns that propagate tec technically inconsistent and actually wrong information about intellectual property. So uh, we have a detailed account of that in the Brazilian chapter uh, about the Lego School project, which involves uh, educating uh, children about the, the evils of piracy 
by the use of industry research, uh, the same numbers that Joe was talking about. Uh, we also, through the, the process of uh, researching for the Brazilian chapter, we found out that three of the main figures that are used in Brazil uh, concerning the damages caused by piracy are actually uh, are not backed by any research at all. So this is not a matter of flawed research, uh, but a matter of in, uh, inexistent research. And these numbers are used uh, in this project to teach children about the evils of piracy. So this is uh, the level of uh, educational policies that we have. Uh, but there is an uh, uh, opportunity for uh, an interesting debate on uh, the digital agenda in Brazil because CNCP so far, the National Council on Company Piracy, has uh, only focused on uh, creating an ISP working group uh, which convened in 2008 a few times and they, uh, I think they still convene from time to time. Uh, it includes uh, ISPs, uh, telecom companies, industry. Uh, and this working group was set out to establish a system of graduated response in Brazil, uh, which would involve not a, a disconnection from the internet, but a, a bandwidth caps after the third strike. This has not really advanced so far, and this is the only project that CNCP has uh, currently on uh, digital uh, piracy. So most of the work CNCP has done, and most of this course, uh, the discourse that was built around piracy in Brazil was actually around hard goods piracy and counterfeiting, and sometimes mixing one with the other. So uh, the forum for uh, the debate uh, of the digital agenda is actually uh, not CNCP at all. CNCP has done little in the past for uh, digital piracy, and uh, there's, there, there, you can hardly say that uh, the CNCP's role is going to be very uh, relevant in the future. Uh, we had a, a proposal, Bill 5361, uh, it's not 90, it's, it's 2009. Uh, it's partly inspired by Hadopi, and it was withdrawn after a very, very negative public reaction. So that tested the waters for a graduated response through uh, legislation in Brazil, and uh, the scenario is not very optimistic for those who back such proposals. And so what we come to in Brazil right now is uh, a public debate on three different proposals that are actually not uh, bills yet. Uh, there's been public consultation processes uh, that have wrapped recently. The first one is on a civil framework for internet law, uh, which we call the Marco Civil. And Brazil actually has no uh, legislation specific uh, to uh, internet liability and other issues that arise from uh, online behavior. So, uh, as a response to a cybercrime bill, a Bill 8499, which uh, sought out to regulate the internet through criminal means, uh, establishing a series of crimes and uh, data retention uh, requirements, uh, due to uh, equally strong public backlash against uh, Bill 8499, the federal government decided to establish a public consultation process on internet rights. and basically concerned with internet infrastructure. So copyright was not part uh, of the debate. It's not part of the debate. But since uh, infrastructure is a central uh, concern for uh, copyright industries, and uh, it, it inevitably uh, there was some overlap between the proposal and uh, other proposals for the regulation of the internet, especially uh, when it comes to digital piracy. So we, after the responses we got, uh, FGV, Getulio Vargas Foundation, the institution I'm, I'm a part of, uh, actually participated along with the Ministry of Justice in conducting this process, and we evaluated around 2,000 public contributions, and there was a clear, clear uh, distaste uh, for proposals such as graduated response, and a clear interest for uh, the protection of network neutrality. So those, uh, those preoccupation was, were, preoccupations were woven into the text of the law, uh, which is about to be sent to Congress. Uh, it's, it's going to happen in a couple of months. And there's actually a, an anti-three strikes provision and an anti g package inspection provision. So this is bound to create some controversy when it reaches Congress. Uh, there's a data protection law that's also under public consultation, and there's strong uh, protection for privacy in this, uh, in this text that probably will clash with some industry interests. 
And finally, there's the copyright reform process, uh, which uh, received uh, more than 8,000 8, contributions from civil society. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, uh, we had a, a change in administration at the Ministry of Culture, and the political orientation of the new administration is actually very, uh, in, in very, uh, it's, it's in the exact opposite direction uh, of the previous administration. So we had a copyright uh, reform bill that was actually very progressive, uh, with a, a clear expansion of limitations and exceptions, and a, a concern for for uh, bridging gaps uh, with regards to uh, content access. And uh, it's unclear how the copyright reform uh, will progress from now on. Uh, alongside the copyright reform proposal, uh, some members of civil society proposed what is called a sharing license, uh, which has some similarities to the proposal Leah was talking about. Uh, it involves a compulsory license for uh, all sorts of content. And a uh, levy that is uh, uh, charged through ISPs. So it's a license to upload and download. And this uh, was proposed as part of the copyright reform uh, process. And it's uh, unclear of how this proposal is, uh, is going to be taken uh, with a new administration. But it had some traction alongside some c sectors of civil society. So that's uh, basically what I had to talk about. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions through email or here. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Um, I know we've been rushing you through, but I'm sure that uh, there are many questions uh, already. So uh, I'll just take a few questions together to start with Helga Trüppel, who is also an MEP with the Green Group and works on copyright issues. Go ahead. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for the ability to talk to you. Thank you for the panelists. Um, I would like to start with some comments and then I have uh, two questions. Um, you, the first uh, speaker, Joe, you argued it's uh, especially a cost problem issue, what we are talking about, uh, because with the new technologies, and that is true what happened uh, in the last 10, 15 years, um, you can get uh, the things what you formerly had controlled by the majors or Hollywood, now you can have it uh, through downloading. But on the other hand, to make it very clear, from my point of view, I think it's uh, to a certain extent a big struggle of the old monopolies like Hollywood and uh, music majors and the new monopolies we are having now like Amazon, Google and, and others. I'm neither a lobbyist for the old monopolies nor for the new ones. I'm very much interested in the value chain, in cultural diversity and how to re remunerate the people who are at the core beginning of the value chain, the artists, creators, and so on. Because I want, um, of course, that there is uh, access to all the different cultural products and possibilities. But I think, um, like Leah said, the interest of the artists and creators is not only to be heard and read, of course, it's their interest, it's as well their interest to be paid and to make a, possibly a living out of their works and to be professionals in this field of cultural diversity. And therefore, now I come to my questions. Uh, when I follow you, Joe, there should be no problem in society today because you say internet or internet piracy is complementary um, to, to uh, the legal offers. But I would talk to a lot of people who say that there is a problem. And I don't mean now the, the big industry, I mean artists, creators, and people working for quality content. And therefore, I cannot share your thesis that there obviously everything is fine. It's only the problem of propaganda of the old monopolies. And therefore, I'm very much interested in new models, how to remunerate artists and producers of creative content. And there I come to my questions, because Leah, she was talking on models, but they were not at all detailed, but all the devil is in the detail. So I think we have to go for this further. And then, Pedro was talking on this sharing license. I would like to know more about that. And of course, if I got it right, you talked on a license for internet service providers for uploading and downloading. Maybe you can a uh, little bit elaborate on that because otherwise I cannot uh, make up my mind concerning these ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Christian Engstrom, also an MEP with the Green Group. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm Christian Engstrom, a member for the Pirate Party. 
Yes, sir, to, uh, roughly the same question uh, uh, as Helga was saying. Mr. Mr. Karaganis, as, as I understood your research, you're saying that people are spending more money anyway on cultural products. So, so perhaps you could, could confirm the, the, that I actually got that right. But then, then, then I'd like to ask Ms. Postma from, from the Consumentenbond. You're proposing a cultural flat rate system. <clears throat> and as Helga said, uh, Mrs. Trupel here was saying, uh, you weren't very, very detailed about it. When it comes to the distribution of the money, uh, there are, as I understand it, basically two different uh, systems for, for handing out the money, deciding which artists, creators, whatever, should, should get it. One, one is to, to use essentially the system we have been using so far to, to look at the playlist from, from, from radio and from television and use that for distributing. That means, if you do that, it means that you give money to, to, the, to the established artists that get played on television. Uh, you don't give, give money to new artists that, that are uh, perhaps traded and uh, shared on the internet, but they haven't made it in, into to the internet. So if you, if you choose that route, you, you essentially get uh, a system for, for taking money from the poor artists and giving it to the rich. That's one alternative. The other alternative is to try to measure what people actually are sharing on the internet, but that runs into, into quite a lot of problems, and I would like to, to hear, hear your responses to, to the detailed problems. First of all, uh, according to, to conservative estimates, a third of everything that's uh, file shared on the internet is pornography. Are you proposing that a third or whatever percentage should go to the pornographic industry? And in that case, do you think you will get political support uh, for, for that idea? Uh, but, <laughs> I, I, I'll put that in two parts, in the Netherlands and in the rest of Europe. That, that, that's why. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps the answer is different. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I can, I can, I can okay. finish that. Uh, Joe, back to me. Sure. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Okay. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, nice to put some name to the, to our face to the name, uh, Joan. Thank you for coming. Um, your research is really very interesting. I actually found myself disagreeing with uh, the lady from the Consumentenbund far more than I would possibly have expected. Um, she started off, and I'd be interested to see if I understood you correctly. You started off by saying that, that consumer privacy needs to be uh, defended which I would wholeheartedly agree with. And uh, then you explained that in cases of commercial uh, infringements, uh, the internet providers, not the infringers um, specifically, but the internet providers should be targeted for increased liability. And I was wondering who you thought the internet providers were going to target in such a situation. Um, uh, what can they do that law enforcement can't do? Well, they can act outside the rule of law, removing websites that they're afraid might be illegal. They can cut people off from the internet like, uh, like uh, Aircom has threatened to do in Ireland. Uh, they can do any number of things outside the rule of law and against their consumers. You're, instead of you're moving enforcement from at least a predictable legal environment into an unpredictable uh, extrajudicial environment, and I cannot understand why you would propose such a thing. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we'll just go... Thank you for the questions. Maybe we'll just go from Joe to Pedro to Lea, and then we'll take another round of questions. Thank you. Sure. Well, I'll speak just briefly to the, the uh, question of re remuneration. Uh, I mean, in our work, we, we go to great pains to try and uh, be very specific about who we're talking about uh, because you know part of the problem with the piracy debate is that it tends to be treated as a unified problem. In fact, it's a problem that affects different sectors of industry very differently, different kinds of artist communities. Uh, there are different, different kinds of digital goods circulate in different ways. So we, we, we break this down sort of sector by sector in the report, the report and in fact argue that between software, film, and music, you have very different degrees of exposure to piracy as a problem. Uh, there are very different business models available for remunerating the creators. Uh, and, and really, you, you need to uh, isolate who you're talking about and what kinds of losses they're exposed to, and then what kinds of lengths you want to go to to try and support the, the, the remuneration of that group. 
So for example, the, the debate about losses over the last decade has been overwhelmingly dominated by claims from the software industry. They just dwarf the claims of other industries. So in, until just last year, the software industry was talking about 52, 53 billion dollars a year in losses. Uh, we don't think that the software industry has any serious problem with respect to piracy, at least in its primary forms. And that there's a specific reason for this. So the software market is organized completely differently than markets for music or film. For uh, companies that enjoy near monopoly positions in software or for companies that are seeking to enter markets, the most important thing you can do is have your software as widely used as possible so that it becomes a standard. In developing markets, you do that by, by tolerating high, high levels of piracy of your goods. That's a documented strategy for Microsoft, documented for a variety of other companies. We go into it at some length in the report. And then what you do is you begin to go after the large institutions, the schools, the, the government agencies, the large businesses, and you negotiate volume licensing deals with them. That's how the software market works. Uh, it has, you know, pi piracy is, a con in that context, a contributor to the network effects that generate value for those software companies. So the, and and you know, that's begun to be reflected in the industry literature. The, industry no, the Business Software Alliance no longer talks about losses. It dropped the language of, lo language of losses last year and now talks about what they call the, the, the value of unlicensed software. Well, that's not, they're, they're no longer claiming $50 billion in losses anymore. And that's the product of, of a decade of pushback against their, their, their methods. So software is in its own category as far as I'm concerned. The rest of it is pretty small scale stuff if you're looking at the size of the industries involved. And, and especially if you're concerned primarily with the European versions of those industries. I, I've, I've, I continue to be confused why the European IP debate is carrying so much of the water for Hollywood. Right? So Europe, both for software and most audiovisual goods, is an importer. And the, the, IP politics for import, IP, uh, the, the politics for IP importing countries has generally been to favor low levels of protection and low levels of enforcement because that creates a consumer surplus, creates transfers of knowledge, uh, you know, the, the, the only strong IP exporting country in the world is the U.S., software and, and, and audiovisual goods. So, you know, in, in thinking through what the, what the enforcement politics of Europe would be, I, I, I think there's a real misrepresentation of, 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 of what the nature of the European investment in IP is. I mean, at, at a practical level, how much is being exported and how much is being imported. So the, and we, we go into this at great length, too. I mean, the, 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 uh, the enforcement debate assumes that losses are just losses, that the money disappears, that, are, that, that losses are suffered, you know, no matter where the money goes, that, um, you know, that, that everybody suffers for, under the same kinds of loss. Uh, that the, the report last year on jobs, piracy and job losses in Europe, funded by BASCAP, the Business Alliance for, I forget what the acronym stands for, but, and conducted by Terra, uh, Terra Consultants, and this came up with the, these numbers that I'm sure have circulated in, the, in these halls, 600,000 to 1.2 million job losses over the next uh, four or five years in Europe. Well, you know, they're looking at audiovisual goods that, you know, for which most of the revenues are going to, going outside of Europe anyway, within the legal market. They were assuming instead that all the losses fall, fall on, your, on the European economy, but uh, for, in, in the film business, two-thirds of the European market is dominated by Hollywood. Well, you, you need to begin to look at where the money goes to determine where the losses fall. Uh, for recording artists, I mean, recording artists are kind of the, the iconic figure in this debate. Uh, clearly, there are, you know, for, 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 for musicians who have made a, a large share of their money through recorded, the sale of recorded uh, of CDs primarily, uh, that's a diminishing market. That's a, that, that they're going to suffer a revenue loss from the decline of the CD. Now, some of that is going to be due to piracy. Some of it's going to be due to other forces. But those groups, and, it's, and you have to decide how big a group this is and how important it is to subsidize it through other, through, other, uh, through other means, that group is going to be a loser in this redistribution of, 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 of revenues. The real question is, can you get a handle on this kind of copying? And we've argued that at this point you can't. The genie is out of the bottle. Recorded media is going to be prolifically shared no matter what you do. And how much do you want to reorganize the, you know, the basic capacities and infrastructures and rights associated with internet use in order to support a, 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 you know, a arguably small set of subgroups of cultural producers? And that's really the question that I think is at stake in the, in the IPRED debate and in most of the enforcement debates over the last decade. And it's important to, under, to, to zero in on what, how big those groups are, what their revenue streams look like, whether they're of such cultural value that you need to find other ways of subsidizing the work they do.
Uh, on the sharing license, uh, we have a, an English translation of the license. Uh, I could forward it to anyone who's interested. But uh, just a, a brief, brief, brief overview. Uh, this is a controversial proposal. Uh, we have uh, a hard time agreeing with uh, all of it, uh, no matter which side we stand. Uh, even within the, the Center for Technology and Society, uh, if we ask different people about uh, their positions on this, uh, on this license, you're, you're going to have very different answers and reactions, uh, some more favorable than others. But uh, it's, it's a proposal that must be done, even if it is to be refused or, or struck down. It's an alternative model. Uh, it's one of the obvious answers to the problem uh, of remuneration. And it, it should be evaluated if it's uh, a proper alternative or not. Uh, as for transferring the, the enforcement duties to ISPs, uh, this would, it would involve not really enforcement through ISPs, but the creation of a collecting society not the same one we have in Brazil for recording music, recorded music, uh, which would be subject to uh, a series of checks uh, on transparency. And uh, uh, this would be uh, not uh, uh, really a pass for, for a free pass for collection. This, is, uh, would be, this would be a system that would be under strict controls. And there's the problem of metrics of how to measure uh, the loaded content and how to balance that with privacy rights, uh, which may be uh, really the, the biggest problem of such a proposal. Uh, and the, the solutions are pointing different directions uh, from uh, uh, not uh, measuring uh, every byte downloaded uh, to very, very rough uh, measures of, of, of the popularity of certain content. But uh, it's, it's a problem that may be uh, impossible to solve. But uh, I'll be happy to forward the proposal to anyone who's interested. Well, um, I have a few questions uh, to answer. Uh, let me see. Uh, first, uh, uh, of course, uh, she was mentioning that the devil's always in the details, and I didn't mention all the details. Well, uh, we have a few copies of the proposal with the details here. And uh, if you wish it to get it in a digital version, we also uh, would be happy to provide you with a PDF copy. So uh, you only uh, should ask us after the meeting. So that's no problem. Um, what I want to tell now about uh, details is that, um, of course, Hella mentioned that artists, of course, want remuneration. And our proposal actually aims at giving more remuneration. I mean, if you look at uh, services like Spotify, who actually are very good but came 10 years too late, also get less remuneration than in an internet payment system with the collective rights management. Because, as I told you, in Holland, the collective rights management one-third of the remuneration to artists, one-third to performing uh, to authors, one-third to performing artists, and one-third to producers. So actually two-thirds goes to the actual creators. So that is quite a lot, and I'm sure and there are not a lot of systems I can think of that give the same amount of remuneration. Um, uh, Mr. Engstrom told, uh, asked uh, uh, about how to uh, settle this remuneration because how are you going to measure? Well, as uh, my neighbor here told, uh, told you, it is very difficult. It is a rough justice system because the more you measure, the more you will have to know the details and maybe the more you're going to infringe privacy. So we are more in favor of a bit of a rough justice system. Um, I see also, um, I'm looking at uh, Erwin Angladau, maybe you can tell something about the payment system in Holland because he's more an expert in payment system than I am. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Um, well, in principle, to answer your question, I think that both consumer, uh, uh, the com Dutch consumer un consumers union and us as artists unions would uh, uh, prefer uh, a system uh, which uh, goes for uh, uh, research and actual use as much as possible uh, when it comes to the dividing of the uh, of, 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 of the remunerations. Uh, I think that is more and more possible. I mean, uh, it's 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 definitely possible with research to come close to uh, actual use. Uh, uh, to go actually for actual use will be difficult sometimes, although, you know, uh, uh, more and more internet platforms like YouTube and, and, and others do measure uh, uh, the use of, 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 of different works uh, because they want to be able to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, 
to 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 attach it to uh, uh, to, to to advertisement or whatever, and uh, uh, so so they have a <coughs> so so they measure that already, not co uh, uh, and and they don't necessarily have to. Uh, 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 keep a link to the actual user to do that so uh, and and to 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 measure how how much uh, uh, which which part of the money should go to this artist or to that artist you don't need that either so uh, i think it is possible to 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 uh, to to circumvent that problem to a large extent but to put it in short i think it's always a trade off i mean in what system how uh, whatever you choose it's always a trade off being uh, because actual use is uh, is uh, put in the legislation, so you have to make it as uh, to fit as best possible. But it's always a trade-off. So we're thinking it's always a rough just system. Um, oh yeah, the last question was concerning about um, the commercial use, um, because you want still to we still want to enforce a commercial commercial use, and that may. Um, According uh, to Joe, I thought, I thought he mentioned that internet providers, um, that means they are going to enforce themselves. Well, we think it a bit different because if you have a home copying exception which extends to uh, uh, downloading at the moment and uh, you go on volunteer agreement to non-commercial uploading, uh, it means that it's an, it's an exception to the copyright law. So uh, we don't think that um, ISPs are going to be the ones to be able to enforce. So it's going to, it's a collective rights management. So it's a collective agreement. The agreement, ex uh, okay, you still don't understand. The agreement extends to all works. So that means that for private use, then consumers are never going to be prosecuted. That's our uh, key element. Thank you. Joe is going to ask a follow-up question, a short one, then we're going to wrap up uh, this panel, but you can hold your questions because I want to then give uh, Anders, who has a presentation on a new business model of his uh, company called Vodler about video on demand online, a chance to give uh, a perspective from that angle, and then we'll ask Joe, uh, this Joe, to... Um, give some more highlights of the report, which uh, would touch upon some of the issues you all have raised and which have not come out in the panel. And then we will give it back to you, uh, participants, for more questions and a discussion for as long as you can all stay and as long as questions keep coming. So, Joe, uh, just your final short follow-up, then Leah, and then we'll end this discussion and go on to uh, uh, the role of society and business models more highlighted. I should have introduced myself to begin with. I'm from European Digital Rights. You specifically made reference to ISP liability with regard to commercial, undefined commercial infringements. If you are giving ISPs liability for the actions of others, they need to investigate and prosecute the actions of others. And that will involve infringing the rights of innocent people as well. And uh, uh, punishing allegedly guilty people. And in, in the Netherlands, there was a study done a few years ago um, where nine out of 12 ISPs deleted websites without question for fear of liability of copyright infringement. That's already the case, and you're, you're asking to increase that fear. Thank you. Uh, no, um, no. What, I'm, what I was mentioning by rebalancing, that's what I want, the ISP li liability, the exempt from ISP liability, is what I mean by that is that at, at the moment, the focus point of enforcement lies at consumers because they cannot enforce on internet platforms. That's also an effect of the exempt liability of ISPs. And that's what I want to rebalance. And I'm totally aware that is is a bit difficult because... Uh, I'm talking only about author's rights here, and that means that internet platforms can be addressed. And in, if you have uh, a copyright exception that for private use, consumers can copy music and film online, non-commercial uploading and downloading is allowed, that means that the focus point of enforcement is not consumers. So 
it's a bit, diff a bit d different angle. But I know what I'm telling. It, it should be, you should, do, you should do it with care because you cannot just remove the ISP uh, exempt from liability. You cannot just remove it, but you should rebalance it. And that point, that's only one detail about the whole exempt from liability I'm talking about. Okay, great. Um, now, I'm going to uh, turn the floor to, uh, to Anders, who is currently the Vice President of Communication at Vodler.com. He will uh, present that case. Um, before that, he was a consultant, but also a research associate at the Harvard Business School. Uh, and um, um, well, I don't know, I think we're waiting for some more technical <laughs> adaptations. Yeah, we definitely, okay, are you? Yeah. So th thanks for having uh, me and, and Vodler here. We, uh, Totally not a research background, very much not a political background. This is the commercial part of the story. Uh, I come from a company called Vodler. Uh, we are a video on demand service online. We show films, documentaries, TV series, uh, straight to your computer at vodler.com. We do this in four countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland. And we just announced that we're going to launch into Spain next, going uh, into the continent. We have deals with 30 of uh, the world's largest content providers. Content providers is such an a antiseptic word, but it means all the Hollywood majors, BBC, the Scandinavian big ones, that bring you movies. Uh, that brings us movies so we can show them. We license, license this from them. And we ask our customers to either pay, rent the movies for a short, a small fee. Right now it's about €3.70 Euro for a rental movie. Or watch a large portion of our catalog completely for free with ads before the movie. Um, so that's the, the business we're in. And I have brought up the site here. And, and <coughs> if, even though if, in Belgium, unfortunately, you can't see it because we're not active here. All our licenses are on a geographic basis. Um, I didn't manage to get a connection, so I can show you pretty much this is what it looks like. And points to the one who can recognize the movie the quickest. The Hours. Great movie. Hollywood, uh, Oscar winner and for free with us with three to five minutes of commercials. You actually actually made you skip the commercials, so you don't have to see those right here, right now. But that brings us revenue that we can share with the content owners, in this case, the movie company, who then distributes it back to the filmmakers. So there is money to be made from free. Free being a consumer offer. This is not free in our world. This is still being paid. And even the rental ones, that are ones I'm going to talk about, um, if we scroll down on the first page here, you can sort of see where we're at with the rentals. And over here on the left side, you can see which movies we're showing right now that you can rent. We get money on those two. And my story right now is going to be how to, to build a service that hopefully makes more movies meet more film viewers to the benefit of more filmmakers, the financial benefit of more filmmakers. Because really, I mean, we we're talking about all the, all the troubles in this, and we all have all our objections. This really is the best of times for making more movies, more cultural goods meet more consumers. Um, last, or yesterday, I spent a lot of time talking to telcos from, from various parts of Europe. Uh, so that's the other part of, of our business we have to discuss with how we actually physically distribute this. Um, but let me, before I jump into all that, let me start with one slide. Because we've been talking up until now about um, piracy in the 
uh, emerging markets. Let's bring this home closer to home where we are right now. Let's talk about uh, piracy in the developed world, uh, specifically my kitchen. And I'll, this is not my kitchen, I wish it was. I could hang out with a cast from Mad Men. But this is just to illustrate a conversation I had in my kitchen a while back with friends that I went to school with. Uh, we are all in our 40s now, pretend we're not, but we have the, the, our children to prove it. We finally put them to sleep. We get to sit down and talk around the kitchen table and we talk about what we try to do. Oh, have you been to the movies? No. Nobody has time to do that. But we watch TV, not really. I mean, we have half an hour after the kids are asleep before we crash ourselves. So what we do, oh, but I do, I've found a couple of TV series I've, I've, I'd like to see, a friend said, and I've want, I love Mad Men. Oh, when is it on, I said. Sunday nights, he said. And I remembered it wasn't on Sunday nights because I remember seeing it on a work night, and he said, no, Sunday nights, AMC in, a, in the US, the AMC channel. Because Monday morning, it'll be on Pirate Bay, and Monday afternoon, it'll probably be subtitled too. And we started looking around the table, and after a while, we all confessed. Okay, we all knew that brothers and sisters are on Wednesday nights in America, Grace Anatomy on Thursday nights, and the list goes on. Modern Family, The Good Wife, all the series we'd like to watch right now. And my point is not just to paint us as illicit f downloaders and file sharers. It's all about availability, is my point. Because this is the same crowd, well-educated, we're well-paid, we have already bought Toy Story 3 five times. One for the car, one for the home, one for the summer house, one just in case, so we have it for the kids so they don't cry. It's not a question of payment. We like paying for stuff. But above all, we need it. And that's the story that I think we've heard a couple of times here about availability, accessibility. You can compete with free. Just provide it. The pirate services out there are actually pretty bad services. Tricky to, to use, hard to manage. You'd never know really what you're downloaded until you have it. So of course we should be able as an industry to offer something better. So our whole approach to, to piracy is actually to, be, to build a service that gives them the full Monty, the customers. We should be able to do something better and again, be able to have revenue models that bring money in and make sure the content owners and above all, the creative artists still get paid. So we do this right now on the computer. We have some collaborations with TV manufacturers and being sure that our stuff can be shown in your living room. But we also would love to be in your pockets. So on mobile phones, there's an iPhone app. There are Android apps, Symbian apps, etc. And this is not just a product spiel on my part. This, this speaks to the other issue we've been talking about here before about uh, private copy rights. Um, or the home copy exception that normally prevails. And a couple of other things that are, I think, going to go away. Not because we need more legislation or because legislation changes, just because technology is going to chase that away. Because of the cloud. If you talk to telcos right now, everybody's talking about the cloud, so of course we have to talk about the cloud too. But streaming and downloading are two fundamentally different things. The movie we just saw was streamed to this. It could be streamed to your, uh, to your TV set. It could be streamed to your mobile phone. No copy made, but you as a consumer have access to it whenever you are. If Spotify taught us anything, it was that it was all about accessibility. You didn't have to download one million MP3 files. It was just for the fact of having the music nearby. So if we can provide film, and I'm not just talking about Vodler, I'm talking about the entire film industry. If we can just make sure that movies are where you are, we can fix this. Essentially, when we launched Vodler, we thought this was great, everybody's going to love us. We launched about two years ago in Sweden, in a beta. We went completely open uh, about a year ago. And this was our proposition to, to the people that we work with, the advertisers, who advertised before our movies. The viewers, of course, were gonna love us because we made it simpler for them and we had all the content. And the content owners definitely were gonna love us. We made sure their content was protected, commercialized, monetized, and respected. So we figured everybody was gonna say this. 
and instead we came up against this. This is how the film industry works, and this is one of the major differences between the film industry and the music industry. Uh, and to a so the, the film industry, a typical film, like The Hours, uh, or what we have right now on Vodler for rental, we have uh, Tron Legacy from Dis Disney. Tron Legacy went on cinema uh, three to four months ago in its first window. So Disney, as every other movie studio, puts it on cinema first, gets as much revenue as they can, then takes it down from cinema. Gives it to the next window, which traditionally has been C uh, DVD. Right now, VOD services like us or others get the same movies. And a VOD service can be a pure web VOD like us, or it could be one of those uh, uh, telco set-top boxes that some of you may have. After a while, say six to nine months, it's going to go away again. So we're not going to even have it for rental, because then it's in its next window, which I mislabeled cable TV here. Uh, it should be say, uh, nowadays it should be saying pay TV. Canal Plus, what have you. It lives there for six to nine months, maybe a year, and then it goes away again and comes back in the free-to-air, which are our traditional broadcasters. This whole chain lives for two to three years. And this is how the movie industry is set up. You, have, you own a movie, you've produced a movie, you have the rights, and you deal with it, license it, it to other people. And we have no objection against this. This is the market forces at work. But what we do, and just to add, what our free stuff, if you remember the list that I showed you before, they are slightly older. The Hours is not a, a new movie. It has a couple of years. So we have it for free nowadays. And of course, we have the illegal window. Let's not forget that, that we started talking about. Our job in, in getting this working is, is purely in, in getting more movies, getting more viewers so we can get more advertisers and more money and then more movies and just hard work. And this I've already shown you how much we're at right now. It takes time. One of the troubles as we are launching into new territories, and this is what I'll, I'll end my little talk on, is clearing rights between geographies. Uh, there is a reason that I've, I've out of here, I've, I've listed 4,000 titles. I'm going to say 3,900 are American. They're not even Swedish for our Swedish audience, where we're most active. And there's a reason that a small company like us, uh, we're only 35 people. I mean, we make it easy. The easy way for us to get a lot of titles is to go to the big Hollywood, the big majors. And where are they? In Hollywood. There are no European majors. If we wanted to build a European catalog and really show the cultural diversity of Europe, we'd have to go to each and every country, find whoever had good movies, negotiate rights, bring it back. And we would do it only for Sweden then, and then we'd have to repeat the, the trip again if we wanted to do it for another country. And for a small company like us, that's not doable. But even for large corporations, we were talking about the Bertelsmanns and the Vivendis of the European world. I don't see them doing it either. So how do we make money? I've already talked about that. My whole point with this is just to show that you can make money. Accessibility is the thing. My friends in the kitchen, they just want to see it when they can. Uh, being there in the cloud and letting people access your movie cloud whenever they can, wherever they can. That's the whole point of the game for us. And then we'll find different business models to pay for it. So this is our own immediate future in all that, building this cloud of movies. This is just hard work. Nothing for legislators or regulators to get into. There is, however, a couple of points that would make life easier for us but more generally speaking, it would make it easier for all digital content in Europe. And this is the written part of the presentation. 
The first one is about multi-territory or easier border crossing for existing movies, the ones I talked about why we don't show movies from other countries or why other countries don't show movies from Sweden <laughs> or anywhere. It's hard. So multi-territory licensing, easier setup for that. Easier collective rights management. We, we heard about collective rights management before. Uh, in the Tron Legacy example I just had, which where we licensed the movie from, from Disney. They have all the rights. They have cleared all the rights backwards. We still have to negotiate the music soundtrack. Great soundtrack by Daft Punk, by the way. Separately with the collecting society in the country where we want to show it. So in Sweden, we talk to STIM. In Denmark, we talk to CODA, etc., etc. And we have to do this for every country again and again and again <coughs> for the same one movie. Give us a one-stop shop clearance. God, that would make life easier for us and again for everybody who wants to promote more movies all over Europe. And localization support is, of course, something at the heart of the EU with all the translators that we're having going on here. Help cultural diversity by localizing. There's also, for, for new film, uh, supporting new film, Europe, as we heard before, I mean, we're, we're rare in that we have a pretty large state-subsidized filmmaking industry in various countries. However, that industry or the subsidies are normally geared towards uh, a structure that's falling apart, the, the window structure I talked about where cinema is the prevalent. So film subsidies and a lot of times are cinema subsidies. Uh, in Sweden, for instance, you can't get state subsidies unless you have cinema distribution for the movie that you want to make. I believe in France it's even written into uh, a directive or decree that cinema all state subsidies should only go to cinema distributed films. And my point nowadays, with all the prevalent different types of clips and films and documentaries and features that are coming out, a film is a film is a film. It should be up to the filmmaker to decide where and how he wants to treat it. So we want window neutrality, we call it, or device neutrality. Again, free the filmmakers and the content owners to really handle and treat their content as they want. Don't give subsidies with, with uh, locks and keys on them or requirements. And the VAT is, of course, a dear subject in, in a lot of areas, even here. Cultural goods are taxed differently at various, various different tax levels. So I understand the complexity involved in this, but it is a problem. And finally, the, um, the third point there is about old films. So the first point was about existing film, the second one about our new film, films in Europe, the third part about our existing films. I was lucky enough to grow up in a, in a film family. My dad was a movie maker, my sister works in the industry, so I was bred on Tarkovsky, Fassbinder, Fellini, all the good ones. I wouldn't even know where to find those movies nowadays to show to my to my little boy. But there is this richness in, in cultural heritage in, in our European film system, or our European film archives. And the film archives have done a tremendous job preserving it, but now they need help digitalizing it and spreading it. Uh, which is again the whole European dream of coming together. So let's show each other what we have. And that is the end of that. Thank you, Anders. Um, we're going to go back to Joe for a few more highlights of his research and then back to you. Uh, I think it was fun how the business case turned out to be the case for European cultural diversity. Um, yeah. <coughs> Maybe I can see some hands just to get a sense of how many questions and how much longer we'll need. One, two, three. Okay. Well, four, <laughs> five. Okay, we'll make sure you all get an opportunity to ask your questions um, after Joe gives a few more uh, highlights of his very, very elaborate study. It's a total of 500 pages, so uh, it must be difficult to make choices, but please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll just spend a few minutes racing through some highlights and we can come back to them in questions if they, if they touch on something that's of particular interest to the group. Uh, 
Okay. So I, I want to say a, a couple words about research because, as, as you know, uh, the EC has just uh, issued a contract for 500,000 euros, roughly, to study the questions of uh, economic losses and, uh, or rather, economic impact, the economic impact of piracy. Uh, this is the contract. And, you know, this is, this is not new terrain, right? I mean, this has been the subject of several decades of industry research, several uh, major international institutional efforts to try and validate those results. Uh, so far, quite unsuccessfully, I should say. So I, I, uh, I wanted to just suggest a couple litmus tests for what good research in this area should include. Uh, first of all, it has to draw a bright line between piracy and counterfeiting, <coughs> counterfeiting of traditional hard goods and digital piracy. This is a distinction that gets routinely conflated in the piracy debate. It's pernicious. It's deliberate. It's confusing things that are, uh, it's confusing the, the essentially consumer-driven practice of, sh of file sharing at this point with types of counterfeiting that are often legitimate public safety and, or health hazards. Those have to be separated out because the networks that, that produce them are now completely distinct. Hard goods, hard goods counterfeiting is still a largely industrial economy of production of goods through factories, of producing countries and, and, and consuming countries and all the transnational traffic, including uh, um, traffic organized by organized criminal groups that, that follows that model. Uh, the digital economy is very different at this point. Uh, it's a largely non-commercial, consumer-driven process. Consequently, the incentives for organized criminal groups have just fallen through the floor. I mean, we hear this, this is another point that gets uh, repeated ad nauseum, but we find very little basis for it in our research. There is no longer any systematic linkage between organized criminal activity and digital piracy. And I'll, I'll, I'll be specific about that because it's, 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 a, it's a subtle point. <laughs> uh, there is almost certainly, there are almost certainly contexts in which you can identify organized criminal groups, the traditional kinds, the gangs, the mafias. You can identify contexts in which they are operating in pirated media markets, software markets, in some cases, movie markets. But our argument is that that is uh, just a minuscule portion of the larger digital pirate economy at this point. And it does no service to either, either policy or, 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 or to just the intellectual integrity of the debate to pretend that, the organi that organized criminal involvement plays in any way a significant role, much less a systematic role, in the pirate economy at this point. It's primarily a consumer-driven phenomenon. So the tools you bring to bear against organized crime and the rhetoric you bring to bear and trying to ratchet up the level of harms that are associated with piracy are really inappropriate to a context that's driven by consumer behavior and consumer infrastructure because the costs of sharing have fallen so far that the, the, the commercial pirates now have to compete with free, the criminals now have to compete with free, and my, for the most part, they don't. They've, they've moved on to other more profitable kinds, more profitable kinds of activity. So that's, a, that's an important distinction. I mentioned the distinction between where Europe is an importing country and an exporting country. There has to be some effort to try and parse that out and figure out where the, where the, where the alleged losses actually fall. Uh, we've argued uh, in part in response to this report, which I mentioned earlier, that it's greatly overrepresenting the, 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 the losses that would actually fall to European businesses and consequently to the European economy. There's a, there, there's, there's a kind of three-step test that has to be applied, or three, three, there are three things to distinguish in this debate. So the piracy of foreign goods in Europe is not a loss to the European economy. That's called a consumer surplus. Secondly, the piracy of European goods in Europe is a loss to whatever sector is being pirated, but not to the economy. That money is spent somewhere else in the economy. It doesn't disappear. Thirdly, the piracy of European goods outside Europe is both a loss to the sector and a loss to the economy in international trade terms. So you have to figure out where that loss is and how much it is. And there's been no literature on this, no effort to figure out where those real losses are falling. And that's where, the, you know, as a policy matter and as a, as a Europe-wide matter, that's where the policy emphasis should be. If there are, if there are legitimate reasons for um, viewing that as a major drain on the European economy, it should, it should be treated in those terms, but not, you know, taking Hollywood losses and saying that represents, you know, directly job losses in Europe. That's not just not a, 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 a uh, a model that has any research integrity. Another key point, what are the, what are the 
what's the value of network effects in software markets in Europe? We've argued that they're huge in developing countries where because of the prices the goods are being sold, there's just no legitimate market for $300 copies of Windows or $1,000 copies of Adobe Creative Suites or you know, all the other tools that are sold at huge premiums and are and maintained at those price levels in countries where the, the incomes just don't permit any kind of practical market. Uh, transparency, where do the numbers come from? Uh, there are a couple industry studies, and this Terra study is one of them that has a 50-page appendix describing its methodology, which as much as I disagree with the study for many of, the, many of the assumptions it makes, it documents those assumptions. So you can go, you can look to it, and it, you know, that's, that's research. <laughs> uh, most of the industry literature, including IFP, the BSA, uh, the RIA, uh, the MPA, they just don't document anything about what they're doing. I'll just note that, uh, you know, there have been a couple enforcement initiatives that have tried to farm out the, the some of this work to international uh, or government bodies that are that, that, that are you know, essentially trying to, to, to validate the industry findings. And as soon as those researchers bring any real critical uh, you know, capacity to bear on the on the research, they they come up with they just throw up their hands. No, there's no existing method for measuring the impact of, of piracy in in, in, uh, uh, in the uh, 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 well within very, very narrow context, but not on the economy in general. So OECD, the GAO, certainly us, we, we, we come, up, come, in, come down in a similar, similar place. Uh, this is an interesting study funded by the Dutch government. If, uh, it's probably the best and most comprehensive study of, of music file sharing in, in Europe that we've seen, although it's dealing with you know, small country dynamics and the peculiarities of the Dutch uh, recording industry. But they are the only study so far, other than ours, to look at the question of what the, what the consumer surplus looks like. So yes, the, you know, there, are recording, there are recording artists who are taking a loss to piracy, but the other side of that equation is a consumer benefit. And th you know, those have to be weighed in looking at the overall economic impact. And their calculation, based on some, some examination of imports and exports into the, into the Dutch uh, music market, is that there's a net 100 million euro consumer surplus to piracy in the in the Dutch music market. Now, in a country of seven million, you could you could imagine what that would look like if you tried to scale it up. You could imagine what it would look like in countries that have much less equal uh, ratios of price to income. I'll just say a little, a couple words about uh, sort of the, the the arc of enforcement over the past ten or fifteen years. I don't know how how constrained on time are we. Shall I wrap this up very quickly? Yeah. I just know that we're running over time, and I see some people leaving, and I would love to give people who are here a chance to ask their questions. So well, this, this go a, ahead, a, and then okay, we'll go sure. to questions. Okay, so the, the USTR, I explained why this is kind of a central object for us. I mean, this is, a, this is a, a, a graph that tracks the different lists that countries appear on when the USTR does its annual reporting on you know, uh, good countries, bad countries, and really bad countries. It's the, it's the, if you're good, you're off the list. Uh, otherwise, you can appear on the watch list or the priority foreign watch list. And back at when the when the me when the measure was originally conceived, there was a there was a priority foreign country list, which meant you were on the fast track to sanctions. Well, the, the WTO came along, and suddenly this unilateral process had to be reconciled with a multilateral process. And so, in practice, the the use of the of the, of the special 301 process for sanctioning countries dropped off the radar. They stopped sanctioning countries because most of the things that that were uh, conceived as the subject of those sanctions were now handled through the WTO. And they didn't want to test the legality of the special 301 process by sanctioning countries unilaterally for things that should have been handled through the multilateral forum. So the sanctions dropped out, but they just ratcheted up the warnings. And in, ca in a case that the E, uh, it was the, I guess the EC brought it in, 90, in 99, there were some, there were some warning signs placed on the special 301 process where it was it, it, the, the possible illegality of special 301 in the context of the larger WTO was alluded to, right? Uh, but it has never been subsequently tested. So you have this, this period between really the, the WTO and now ACTA where the main mechanism for applying higher level, you know, sort of ratcheting up enforcement standards has, has been, you know, arguably out of compliance with the WTO and in any case, you know, built largely around a, this, these kinds of, of soft power mechanisms, where everybody knows that they're not going to get sanctioned, but you know the 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 warnings the warning lists are used to signal displeasure, and uh, from the warning lists, which are really vaguely worded, you can then go back to the industry reports that tell you what you really need to do to get off the warning list. 
That's, that's how the process has tended to work over the last 15 years. And that's really come to, coming to an end with ACTA, which is an attempt to create a new kind of benchmark, a new, a, a new floor for enforcement activities, to create a new separate organization that circumvents all the other multilateral organizations where there's just no longer any consensus about these issues. Right? So the, WT, the, the, the WTO is stalemated, WIPO is stalemated. Anywhere where you have a genuinely representative body that notably includes representation of the developing countries, it's a stalemate. The developing countries have gotten their acts together to the point where they can block any substantive new obligations on them, costly obligations. You know, that's, the, that's ACTA in a nutshell. It's an effort to create a new institution that can circumvent the stalemate in the other genuinely multilateral institutions. And so you, you have a process that locks out all the, pe all the troublemakers, the Brazils, the Indias, the Chinas, the, you know, the Russias, the, go on, the list goes on, uh, come up with a new standard, promulgate that th back through processes like Special 301. So Special 301 becomes the vehicle for, get, for gradually building up compliance with ACTA, and then it becomes the basis for ACTA Plus and ACTA Plus Plus and all the other things that will follow. Uh, and that's really where we, you know, that's where our primary intervention around the ACTA debate has occurred, really around this question of participation and process, which, has, which is designed to uh, do an end run around this very genuine disagreement about what the relationship between enforcement and development looks like in Brazil, India, and other developing countries. Uh, I'll just say a word about the Special 301 process. It was a closed, black, you know, just a closed process of a black box. Nobody knew how, uh, you know, what kind of deliberations occurred. As the, it was clear that industry reports would go in, and then, you know, they'd be kind of diluted or made, the, the wording would be made less clear, but then they'd, the recommendations would closely follow the, whatever industry reports had gone into the process. Uh, that's changed in the last couple of years as we've begun to push the USTR to honor what are technically its commitments to holding things like hearings <laughs> or uh, a comment process that's longer than, than one day, which in, in practice made it impossible for countries to respond to same year comments. They could only respond to the previous year's comments and in practice none of them bothered because there, it, was, it was viewed as, a, as a, a pointless exercise. So countries have historically ignored, uh, ignored the, the USTR or submitted to it, but, the, but they haven't really engaged it. And hopefully that's begun to change. And I'll stop there just because in, in light of the time constraints. Thank you. Um, now, please raise your hands again because I forgot who all has questions. I'll start with people who haven't had a chance and then we'll go back. Yeah, all the way in the back. Go ahead. Um, hi, thanks. Um, my name is Jamie Patello. I work for Telefonica. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one to Joe. Um, when your report first came out, I read some very interesting um, findings that were contained therein about the effect of competition uh, on licensing of rights. Um, I think pointing, using the example of India, where um, com in contrast to the US and the EU where exclusive rights around things like uh, top-level sport and films tends to be given only on an exclusive basis. In India, that doesn't seem to be the case, which has led to competition, lower prices, and, and actually less, less documented piracy. So I was wondering if you could, if you could elaborate on, on that. I know it's a very long report, but if you have any more information, that would be very useful to have. Um, and then um, a second question to, to Pedro and Leia. Um, we just had a very interesting example of a fantastic new service from, from Anders about Vodler. And I was wondering how you think having a flat rate uh, payment on your internet connection is going to help motivate the growth of those kind of services that Fodler is trying to push. Thanks. Um, my name is Morten Lugego. I'm a Danish member of this parliament and uh, thank you very much to the panel for I think very fruitful uh, interventions. Um, it's no secret that we are desperately seeking to a solid standpoint at the moment in this uh, very uh, uh, interesting but also, also complicated discussion. Uh, I take comfort in the fact that it seems uh, that the, the market actually works when it comes to, uh, to uh, some part of this. Uh, and uh, I have just uh, two questions to you, Anas, uh, because I think you, were, you had a very in, um, interesting presentation. And I, I know you, you presented a slide with uh, some uh, suggestion for us at the political level. Uh, and I'd like to start there. Uh, we're talking about uh, about the, the collecting system, uh, and I totally agree in, on what you're suggesting, but uh, the, the, the fact of life is that we have to live with these collecting societies, uh, and I don't think we'll get rid of them uh, uh, for the moment. 
maybe we should not. I don't know. But uh, I wonder if you have could just elabor elaborate a little bit about uh, what you could see as, as the the best of answers to to the collecting societies as they are now. I mean, they, we are looking at uh, the near future and perhaps some kind of of reform of this system, and maybe that could be part of the solution. But what would be your your idea the, of, of, uh, of your ideal there uh, in this in this area? And secondly, uh, I mean, you are not talking a lot about enforcement. I can understand that. For why why bother? But uh, in this in this house, we are talking pretty much about uh, enforcement. We already had one report uh, focusing on inf on enforcement. So how do you look at enforcement as such? We have uh, some of, of, the, of the academics here talking a lot about uh, this not working. Uh, but do you have any kind of, of uh, idea uh, on this, on how it will work or not? There is a button on the top. Yes. Hi, my name is Carol Tung. I'm a former MEP. I'm working with uh, trade unions in the creative industries and rights holders. And I'm chair of the UK Coalition for Cultural Diversity. And I'd like to put a couple of questions, if I may, to Anders. Um, looking back to the support that people like you could, and hopefully you do, maybe you confirm that you get support from the media programme. <laughs> Back in the 90s, this was something we wanted to ensure that people developing video on demand uh, within a European context would get uh, support. So, is that so? And you put forward an interesting vision, and a vision I and many others, and I think probably everybody in this room supports, which is getting more of uh, the heritage European films there accessible. So. Could the media program in that sense do more? Should it have more resources? And Mr. Lockergaard was looking for some concrete policy options. Is that one? One always feels that the media program is suddenly under, or, or very under threat. <laughs> and uh, so is that something you uh, would support? And just on multi-territorial licensing, there was a very interesting report by Philip Kern Associates that warned that it's not necessarily the solution to support European film and the promotion and the marketing of European film. I wondered if you had any comment upon that because it tends to be if it's Babette's Feast or it's Antonia's Line or some of the European greats, they need very focused promotion and marketing in individual markets. Thank you. I think those three are, are a good set and then we'll take another set because otherwise it gets a bit too much. So Anders, do you want to start? Yes. So great questions, all of them, and, and, and issues that we battle with on a, on a running day, daily basis. Um, the question about flat rates. Um, right now, we work best in, in, a, in situations where there are flat rates. Um, I also didn't talk about our technical solution, which in part actually takes a cue from existing uh, illicit sites out there. So it's a bit torrent-based uh, distribution system, so we definitely work best in flat rates. Um, However, um, we don't see flat rates. Uh, if flat rates were to go away, that's not going to stop us. Uh, it's going to change the pricing models. It's going to uh, have. We're going to have to go back and look at how we do revenue shares. We're going to have to renegotiate the value chain. It doesn't stop. Um, and uh, the examples we've seen with in other countries. I mean, the things we can play with is is a uh, if. If you as a consumer have signed up with a telco and you only have a lower bandwidth requirement, we can deliver a, a poorer picture. So there are things we can play with. Um, so, so we don't see that as a, as a showstopper. Um, collecting societies. <laughs> um, we don't propose to get, sort of get rid of them or, or make them go away, uh, but it would be so much easier for us in Europe if, there, if we had cleared it in one country, we had cleared it for all. Uh, I believe there's a, an EU directive from ba back in the 80s about broadcast signals being cleared in one country, being cleared in all. Uh, so perhaps there is help that could be sought in that directive and apply it to, to the digital market. Because um, right now, we, I mean, there are different price levels in each country also. We don't really know what we're paying for, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, so the price level in one country differs from the price level in another country, and it's the same movie. Um, enforcement, uh, luckily we've, we've chosen a business where we don't have to think about it. <laughs> uh, 
Because we, I mean, there are two approaches to getting rid of pirates. We believe one is enforcement, and the other one is to offer a better service. And we've opted to create a better service. Uh, we believe the pirates should go away. They kill the, the in the long term, they kill the creative in, industries. Um, but let's let's create a better service. Um, EU media program. No, we don't have any support. We haven't, uh, partly because we haven't asked for it. Uh, we found good investors instead. Um, uh, we are looking into it and seeing if something applies. Most of the EU media program, when we look at it, is so specific that for somebody who's trying to create a fairly general solution, we actually don't, our problems don't apply. Um, I did read the, the Philip Kearns uh, study, uh, not in detail, it was very, <laughs> very thick, but part of it. So the multi-territory licensing, I think he, there are two issues actually confounded into one. One is making things available, and then it's the question of marketing. Um, so in this dream vision where all the movies live in a cloud and everybody can access it, we're going to have a problem of, and I say problem, it's a good problem to have. We're going to have too many movies and people are not going to be able to choose. It becomes a, a problem of exploration and how can we help movies find it their way out? How are we going to create blockbusters? Uh, but that, I think, is, is a market, market me mechanisms are going to solve that. Um, so the, the first step for me is to make sure that <laughs> Babette's Feast is out there. Uh, and then let's worry about how to market it. Um, the filmmakers are going to find their ways to market things. And if you look into social media and all the different avenues that are out there right now to generate buzz, there are great ways for, for independent filmmakers to generate bus. And we've had a few uh, Swedish filmmakers open their films on Vodler with no traditional marketing, uh, but only social media. So there are new avenues for sort of uh, active filmmakers. Well, I, for me, it's very easy to keep it short because you actually gave a lot of the answer. Uh, maybe to state um, a nice example, if you download a Teletubbies movie from the Pirate Bay, where it just starts immediately, and uh, right now if you buy it in the store, you put your DVD in, and first you have to watch in Holland. I don't know in, in other countries, but I'm sure it will be similar. First you have to watch a, mo uh, a warning, which you cannot just put on fast forward, then you have to see, see three commercials, and then you can actually start. And every time you reload the DVD, you have to watch it again. So I'm not sure a kid will see that as a good quality DVD. So I think on quality, there's a whole world to win. On the question of pricing, uh, I've put up a slide that, that shows the prices of the, the legal prices of uh, domestically produced hit films for some of the countries we were looking at, and the CPP price next to it is—it's a bit of a gimmick, but uh, it, it's the price of the—it's it's what the good would cost for U.S. consumers if it represented a similar share of GDP per capita. So it's a way of localizing the costs in terms of, and then. And just recasting it in terms of what it, you know, how expensive the good is in, in terms of local incomes, and you end up with absurd numbers for the most part uh, that are really indicative of the fact that these, the, the legal DVD market in most of these countries is just tiny. I mean, it's a, it serves a fraction of the population. Uh, but you know, for us, India is a very interesting case, and what, what makes it important is that it's a low-income country where nearly all the uh, the media industry is domestically owned and domestically uh, focused so that its, its primary goal is to expand the Indian audience. And we found that when, when, that, uh, when you have those conditions, uh, prices fall. Prices, uh, th there's much greater incentive to, to price toward uh, much wider, poorer audiences at levels that they can afford. And so what you see in this chart is you know, the top Four films. Uh, I mean, we, we, we also began with the hypothesis that this would be true in general, that domestically produced film in, in Mexico or Russia would be priced at lower levels than a Hollywood DVD. Not the case. You know, for the top tier of film production in most of these countries, uh, it's already part of the international system of distribution and investment and the cost structures are the same. And you know, they get they, They're distributed at the same price as, as most Hollywood productions. So there's no effort to, to expand the market in Mexico or in Brazil for domestically produced films. In India, where you have Indian companies c competing like crazy for Indian audiences, prices have collapsed. Uh, and they've collapsed in the context of 90% piracy uh, and in the context of a, of, a, of a home video market that has grown, uh, I mean, I have a chart for, of it somewhere, but it's, it's, it's grown very quickly in the last few years. So, you know, there's, there's, for us, 
what it suggested was that, that there's a, an underappreciated competition problem here where, uh, you know, oddly, I mean, we, we usually characterize Europe and the U.S. as competitive media markets compared to places like Brazil or South Africa where you have no disruptive competitors in the marketplace who are driving down prices who are really, uh, you know, pushing for new distribution models. If you look in Brazil or South Africa or, or Russia, uh, in, in the, the software or audiovisual sector, you're, you're, ta you're talking about the same big labels and the same, uh, the, the same studios, the same software companies. Um, you know, the, the, the price income differ differential in the U.S. and Europe makes that a different calculation. Those same companies are, are catering to a much broader audience. Uh, the only real counterexample we have is India, where the, the, that, that, that difference in having competitive domestic, uh, competitive domestic companies just makes a huge difference. And all this take, has taken place without the internet. I mean, this is the DVD market we're talking about. So it's not, it's, it's not entirely contingent on the next sort of distribution revolution in India. That will happen on the backs of this infrastructure that have, that's been built around DVDs. And the ex consumer expectations will be set accordingly. It will reach a much wider market. Quick addition, just because I, I forgot to say about digitalization and the EU media program, I definitely think that's a room for it. Um, there are a lot of movies out there that aren't really market, the market forces won't take care of. But if they were out there, a lot of us would show them. Now for the last round of questions. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Agata Pavia and I represent IFPI, which is the, yeah, my name is Agata Pavia. I represent IFPI, which is uh, the record industry worldwide. I have just a couple of questions. One is for the representative of the just Dutch Consumer Organization. Um, you are talking about a cultural flight rate, where you basically legalize um, the illegal uploading and downloading. How you are going to support the legal uh, market if you are legalizing the legal markets? Um, how Butler or any other online platforms, for example, iTunes, Amazon, is going to be able to develop their business is if you are legalizing the illegal markets. You are making all these uh, available, all these products and music uh, for free without remunerating the right holders. What incentive are you doing to businesses uh, to create uh, new legal offers? That will be the first question. So I'm not really understand how do you uh, imagine to create this uh, new legal alternative ways of remuneration. And the second question, or rather a comment to Joe, was the fact that uh, well, similar to the experience that uh, uh, they explain about Baudelaire uh, in the film sector, the music industry has been developing new legal offers for the last 10 years. We have worldwide 400 legal sites, 4 million songs available on internet. So there are legal offers, many of them in the music sector. We have been working hard for that. However, we still have piracy. In the UK, for example, you have 70 legal sites where they have good products, you have streaming, you have downloading, you have video on demand, you have subscription, you have YouTube, you have many ways to go legally, and still you have 70% of piracy. So, uh, granted, legal offers are important, but enforcement is also important. And you say there is a rise of enforcement, maybe because there is a rise of piracy. You cannot delink piracy from enforcement. There is more piracy, well, there might be more enforcement measures. So my question will be, or my comment will be, Legal offers are important, and we are doing a lot of that in all sectors, whether it's uh, video, uh, music, or um, video games, for example. But enforcement is also important. My name is uh, Rick Falkvinge, and I am with the Pirate Party in Sweden. Thanking member Schake, I hope I pronounced that right, and the distinguished panel for a very interesting discussion here, I am still noting that a significant portion of it has been devoted to the remuneration of cultural entrepreneurs. We don't see any discussions in policymaking about remuneration to entrepreneurs in bricklaying, in plumbing, or to marketing experts. My point here is an observation here is that people who choose to go into business in culture are, after all, subject to the same rules as any other entrepreneur, that they need to provide something which somebody else is prepared to pay for. 
as long as they can do that, they don't need any laws to prop up their business. On the other hand, if they cannot do that, no conceivable laws are going to change their business. So by logic, as well as by the unanimous observations of the panel, that the enforcement of the copyright monopoly is not working. I can't see how this is an issue that can be fixed by policymaking, but ultimately needs to be fixed by entrepreneurship and the free market. So my question to the panel as a whole would be how you regard issues that I see as political in this arena, uh, such as preserving the diversity of our European culture, which with an extremely rich diversity, the access to culture for the citizenry as a whole, and how to, how to make sure that the heritage of our culture from last century remains accessible, which is now locked in and quite literally rotting away in vaults, which I see as political problems. Thank you. Any last questions? Wow, okay, great. So let's uh, give each panelist an opportunity to answer the questions and share any concluding remarks, and then we'll just go down the line and I'll wrap up. Leia can start. Yes, thanks. Okay, well, uh, first of all, um, I noted the question of uh, AFP. Um, well, um, of course, a proposal for a flat rate. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong paper. Your question was about how legal services can, uh, how will legal services survive? Um, well, like I noted before, the most important thing which I see still lacking is you have a lot of download sites, you have everything, but you're still not competing on quality. You still miss the digital revolution, in my point of view. Um, I think uh, by fighting peer-to-peer -peer use, you will not solve the problem. It all lies on innovating and creating new business models. That's what I believe in. Because I really think that consumers want to have music and film and access. And the second question... Sorry. Um. Ah, yeah, the second question was by the, by the Pirate Party. It was on um, how do you see uh, to, to make the culture needs diversity and culture, the access to a culture and its heritage is a problem and how should it be uh, better? Well, actually what we think is if you, for private use, uh, that's in our uh, proposal, if you uh, just make non-commercial uploading and downloading for private use legal, then you keep the market more open so actually our, our uh, option, our proposal is uh, in its basis an idea for enabling use and getting more free flow of information instead of disabling and punishing users and punishing consumers. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> on the matter of uh, how to support the legal market, if you're supporting the legal market, well, this, uh, if uh, such a proposal would be approved, this would become the legal market. Uh, any competing uh, services would, be, would have to compete on the basis of a better service. And as far as I know uh, of certain pirate sites, I mean, there's actually good service provided by pirate uh, communities uh, that uh, the industry could learn from. I mean, there's certainly some cues about consumer uh, expectations that can be monitored and uh, studied. Uh, if you look at uh, some private communities of file sharing. So uh, this is a, a proposal for an alternative system. Is it a good one? I don't know. Uh, as for cultural diversity, the Brazilian proposal, uh, which is, uh, I should stress, not a formal proposal. It has not been uh, delivered to Congress by any uh, member of the Brazilian Congress. Uh, it's still only a, an academic proposal. Uh, it provides for a 20% of uh, every, every, everything that's collected through the, the, the new system to be dedicated to a fund to promote uh, cultural diversity and ac access to content. So uh, the specifics of, of how that should be uh, managed uh, in terms of, of the, the details, and this is deferred to further regulation. So uh, I don't have an, any quick answers here, but there is uh, some certain uh, amount of money that is reserved and, and dedicated to that specific purpose. Just a word on enforcement. I, mean, I, 
think it's important to distinguish between two sides of enforcement. One is the traditional uh, criminal standard uh, that basically is des designed to target commercial scale infringement. So, uh, you know, traditionally the, the, the threshold for criminal enforcement is always is the, is the pirate operating on a commercial scale where, com where the commercial standard was about making profit. Uh, the problem is that that's a very poor fit with today's internet where the, the predominant form of circulation of, of, of copyright infringing goods is, is uh, by consumers. Uh, we've, we looked at this pretty closely in, in most of the countries we looked at in our report. I'll just show you one last slide. So this is how enforcement works if you're looking at it in Brazil or India. You, you have a massive scaling up of the front end of the enforcement apparatus and no comparable scaling up of due process. It turns out to be much easier to ramp up raids than to process cases through court to give people an opportunity to represent themselves as defendants. And this is really the dilemma that's, that's facing the internet enforcement as well. Where's the due process for people who are accused of infringing? Uh, what are, what's their recourse? Uh, you know, we'll see whether Hadopi survives the next few months in France. I mean, Sarkozy is backpedaling from it. Uh, Hadopi and other three strikes measures raise exactly the same kinds of questions. You can scale up the punishment side, especially if the punishment happens extra juridically. Uh, it's very hard to provide the kind of due process that disconnection from the internet warrants because of how much of your, the rest of your social, political, and economic life passes through internet connection these days. So that's really the dilemma I see. And I think ultimately uh, existing law is fine for pursuing the kinds of commercial, inf commercial scale infringement that still, char still characterizes corners of the market. If somebody is moving in to disrupt a legally functioning market on a commercial scale, is making a lot of money for it, go after them. But the consumer level stuff at some point just has to be legalized. It has to be treated as, uh, as uh, you, know, you know, essentially tolerated behavior, if not legal behavior. And that's, that, I think, is important in order to guarantee all the other rights that are incumbent on internet use and uh, sort of access to the digital economy, digital revolution. Thank you. Um, to, to Rick's question, um, which I'm not sure I qu completely understood, because in the beginning there, when you the bricklayer example, I thought you were arguing for market forces uh, for all cultural goods. Uh, but then you asked, what are we going to do with, with the stuff in the archives that the, apparently the market forces aren't handling? Um, and I, I mean, there are a, a large portion of the cultural market which is, mark, which is fully functional on the, on the open market. Then there are a lot of art that isn't done on the open market. So I believe that there is a role for state and government to subsidize and go in. And we have public service systems uh, for that mere fact. Um, and I think those same subsidy systems could be used to help uh, open up our archives, be they film archives or something else. Uh, there is an interesting... Uh, analogy you can do between public sector information uh, and the directives coming out of that and the stuff that is in the public service archives. Uh, and interestingly enough, the BBC, I understand, is doing a lot of work on this, trying to create ecosystems where, uh, where, where things are being spread on more sites. Swedish uh, educational radio, Utbildings Radio, uh, and also Swedish radio are doing embeddable uh, players. So you can take their content and show elsewhere. So I think there are some fun initiatives. The question now is, how do we get the old stuff out there too? Okay. Well, I would like to thank everybody for their patience and participation for this discussion, which I think could have gone on a lot longer. Um, I also want to thank the panelists for coming here and sharing uh, their thoughts in a in a. Uh, compressed way, but we still very much appreciate it and uh, we will look up the links you've provided to your research and presentations. Um, it seems like in this discussion about piracy or copyrights or uh, the cultural landscape of Europe, the digital market in Europe, there are economic arguments, legal arguments, but also principled arguments about respect for fundamental rights when enforcement is discussed, and the intrinsic value of arts and culture, which we believe is a part of an open democracy. And we've tried to uh, break these down a little bit and add some more transparency to a discussion that is cluttered by intense uh, lobbying and a lack of facts, as we've uh, learned. We've talked about the EU's competitive position in the world. Are we winning it or losing it to other uh, players who have different systems than we do? 
And we've talked about a number of hurdles and barriers for artists, for consumers, for small and medium-sized enterprises and startups, as well as for big companies. And we've talked about hurdles to uh, a free market and the effective working of competition. We've seen that new business, business models can compete with free and can actually help foster the preservation of cultural diversity in Europe, which we are all so proud of and which we should uh, cherish because we live in an area in the world that has the most rich and diverse content to offer and we should think about this more, uh, as well as the fostering of uh, innovation. I think it was great to see that uh, when the content was displayed, because we're having a discussion about facts and figures and words and discussions, but as soon as a clip of content was shown, there were smiles on everybody's faces. And uh, we should probably remember that it's about this, about the creation and how we can uh, access that and how we can profit from that uh, in all layers of the chain and take away those barriers. Uh, the advice that was given to us was very concrete and we take that on board, so thank you very much. And uh, we will try to work with that and continue to rethink the discussion on media piracy because if anything, I do believe that today's seminar has uh, shown that that's a necessity in the EU. So once again, thank you very much and have a wonderful day.